Glad to have Brother Ben Gizelbach with us today. I think I first met Brother Ben maybe at the power lectureships, as far as I can remember, at South Haven. We perhaps have been on the uh, lectureship program together. Uh, Brother Ben does a, a good job, a very likable fellow. I think maybe this is his first time to be on the Memphis School of Preaching lectureship, but we are certainly glad that he is here. He is a graduate of Freed Hardman University, I think 2011. 2011. Uh, he's married to the former Hannah Colley, and so I may know some of his distant relatives. Uh, he and Hannah have two children, Ezra and Colleyanna. Brother Ben is the minister of the Edgewood Church of Christ in Columbus, Georgia, and I heard him telling someone today that he enjoys that. That's always good to know that gospel preachers in an area where they're enjoying their work, preaching the word, and hopefully accomplishing, and no doubt he is, a lot of good. He is also author and writer, uh, writer uh, writes regularly rather for plainsimplefaith.com. Today he's speaking, of course, to us from the book of 1 Peter, chapter 3, verses 13 through 17, Defending Self Under Fire. And so I know that we'll appreciate the sermon that we're about to hear and not to take any more of his time, turn it over to Brother Ben. Thank you, Brother Bland. It saddens me when I think about the dropout rate among new converts to Christianity. Short-term mission campaigns often suffer from this problem. You're gone for a week or two in a foreign land. You return back to the States from what seems like a successful trip. Perhaps you baptize 34 people and you entrusted those souls to the local congregation in that land. But when you return a year later, only a fraction often remain. It breaks your heart. Prison ministries often suffer from this. You hear reports of 20 inmates being baptized last month. Then they get released from prison. And often you never hear from them again. Where did they go? So many people who leave the church. They leave the church not, not because they experienced any kind of extreme form of pressure or persecution. They simply got bored with their walk with the Lord. And it's for this reason that I'm often very reluctant to baptize someone if I don't know them, if I don't know what they have been taught. Now, don't get me wrong, because I really want to baptize them. I, I want to baptize them, but I just don't know anything about the stranger. I don't know anything about their past religious background. I don't know their current level of understanding of God's word or God's will for his life. You see, if he doesn't know why he's getting baptized, I believe that he's merely getting wet. In fact, just three weeks ago, I had a gentleman come to the church building. He came to my study and said, I want to be baptized. Well, I'd never seen this man before. And so I said, yes, yes, well, I'd be happy to. And so I took him aside and we opened the Bible together and we started studying just a few questions in. You know what he said to me? He said, well, I don't have any sin in my life. Oh, really? See, if baptism is meaningless, then by baptizing that gentleman or any other person that I don't know and sending them on their merry way, what I risk doing is I risk giving them a false peace of mind. The very last thing I want to do is give someone hope when perhaps that is the last thing they need at that moment. You see, there's a very real sense in which baptizing someone without knowing their level of understanding, makes me complicit in something that could very well be wrong. 1 Timothy chapter 5, verse 22 says not to share in other people's sins, to keep ourselves pure. Now, this does not change the fact that that gentleman and every person that you know outside of this building needs to be baptized. And so when someone says they want to be baptized, Everything else needs to come to a standstill, and I need to talk to that man with great urgency because there's some things that I need to make sure that man needs to know. If I'm to have a, a clear conscience before my Lord, I need to make sure that he knows something about Jesus 
and has at least a, a rudimentary understanding of God's scheme of redemption. Because I would argue that in the book of Acts, those people, before they put on Christ in baptism, knew something about those things. I need to make sure he understands the meaning of sin and that he understands what sin has done to his relationship with God. Isaiah 59, 1 and 2 talks about how sin severs our relationship with God. Now listen to me. If you are not heartbroken, if it does not make you shudder to think about your relationship being cut off from God, you don't need to be baptized. I need to make sure that he understands what it means to repent and what repentance would look like in his in his life, because my Lord told people they needed to count the cost before they became his disciples. Luke chapter 14, you find that instruction there. How dare I tell someone they need to repent with just a blanket statement without teaching them what repentance actually is? I need to make sure he knows that his baptism is for the remission of sins, Acts 2.38, that he knows his sins are forgiven only at the moment of baptism. Acts 22, 16. I need to make sure that he knows he needs to live faithfully for the rest of his days. Revelation 2, 10, be faithful until death. He needs to seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. And that he's going to be walking in the light as Christ is in the light. It begs the question, how much does someone need to know to become a Christian? Well, we all agree that you don't have to have an exhaustive understanding of the Bible to become a Christian. Otherwise, Perhaps none of us in this room would be eligible for immersion into Christ. On the other hand, there are some basic things, things that we have just discussed, that a man needs to know in order to become a Christian. And so after teaching someone the gospel, there are two main questions that I ask myself about the person who is expressing interest in the gospel. The first thing I ask, is this person dead enough to be buried Romans 6.4 describes baptism as a burial. Therefore, we were buried with him through baptism into death, that just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so, we also should walk in newness of life. You see, baptism is a burial of the dead. Yet if someone is not heartbroken over their sins, if someone is not willing to leave whatever sinful lifestyle or relationship they had, then they're not dead enough to be buried. The second thing that I ask is, has this person sanctified in his heart Christ as Lord? That's found in our text today. First Peter chapter 3, if you want an outline of our text, go ahead and turn there now. Has this man sanctified in his heart Christ as Lord? See, if this man hasn't sanctified in his heart Christ as Lord, then the moment he encounters persecution or pain or pressure, then that's going to be the very beginning of the end for him. The fleeting ple uh, pleasures of sin, as Hebrews chapter 11 describes it, that's going to choke him away and it's going to win the hearts and minds of the unconverted soul sitting in the pews next to us. You see, the reason why all of this is so important, why, why make a big deal about this, Ben? Well, it's because of this matter of persecution. Because you and I know all too well that Christianity is no cakewalk. You see, so many of the Christians living in the day of Peter, they knew persecution. They lived under daily threat of legal, financial, physical persecution. When I think about the kind of suffering that Christians knew in, in, in the early days of the church, I think about that, that list of things that, that Paul said would not separate us from the love of Christ. Romans chapter 8. 35 through 39, you read this long list, and I read that list. Nakedness, famine, distress... And I feel a little sheepish when I read that list because I can't really relate to that. You and I, more than any other time in the history of the church, have it good. The Lord has been good to us. The last 200 years have seen, to my awareness, virtually no imprisonments or deaths of Christians in the free world, in the Western society. I have a very hard time relating to Christians who face physical threats. What would happen to our numbers in this country if, if the possibility 
became a reality. It could happen in our lifetime, you know. We could see real persecution. What would that do to us? Now, I don't want to minimize the fact that we still face persecution as Christians. It just expresses itself in different ways. It might express itself in forms of emotional or mental stress of a marriage divided over the allegiance of Christ. You find that in 1 Peter chapter 3, right before our text. It might present itself as harsh and unreasonable treatment of one's, from one's superiors. You read about that in 1 Peter chapter 2. It might take the form of heartache, humiliation, because you're vilified, misrepresented, ridiculed, insulted for simply honorably trying to follow your Lord. You and I are going to face cold handshakes, innuendos, whisper campaigns, all because the world is surprised when you do not join them in their sin. As 1 Peter chapter 4, verse 4 says. You see, our commitment to an absolute moral standard, our unresolved commitment to this book right here, is always going to be seen by the world, by secular people, by pagan people, as, as just unbearable judgmentalism. Don't be surprised, as 1 Peter chapter 4, verse 12 says. Don't be surprised when you face persecution. You see, we need to remember that promise. 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 12, all who desire to live a godly life in Christ Jesus will suffer persecution. And so if we have put on Christ in baptism, what we have agreed to do is we've agreed to follow our Lord's example all the way, even if it means participating with our Lord in unjust suffering. When that happens... Peter gives us five principles to remember. Five principles. Here's the first principle we need to keep in mind. Be zealous for what is good. Verse 13 of our text says, And who is he who will harm you if you become followers of what is good? Well, the implied answer to that question is very few people. Not very many people are going to attack you. If, if you're obviously following Christ, if you have his character deep within you, if you are just inherently good, it's going to deter persecution. It's very unusual for people who are intentionally hostile toward Christianity, and we've met those people, to wish physical harm on those who are zealous for what is good. Most people in the world... As, as secular, as antichrist as they might be, they find the inherent goodness of Christianity admirable. Proverbs chapter 16, verse 7 says, When a man's ways please the Lord, he makes even his enemies be at peace with him. Of course, that's not 100% true. It's a proverb. But it's a general truth. The world finds Christianity admirable. Now that verb that's translated, if you become in verse 13, it means to become, uh, it, mean, it means that our commitment to, to that which is good is part of what makes us us, what makes us Christians. It's part of our, our fundamental nature. It's not just the, an occasional good thing that we do every now and then if we have to, but it, it's who we are. It, it's, a, it's a love for things that are right. You and I are to live lives characterized by generosity by selflessness, by kindness, by thoughtfulness, by charity. People see that in us. They are to see that. And it could just be that you are under fire right now because you happen to be a person that it's easy not to like. You ever met someone like that? Someone that's just kind of mean, ornery, grumpy all the time, and it's kind of it's hard to like them. And Peter's commanding the opposite. We need to be people who are known by our goodness, by our kindness. You see, when people see our good works, they're motivated to give glory to God. That's what, that's what Jesus said in the Sermon on the Mount there in Matthew chapter 5, verse 16. Or at least they'll lessen their resolve to persecute us. Peter wants us to be zealous for what is noble. He wants us to be passionate for what is good. Number two. We need to be willing to suffer for righteousness' sake. Verse 14 says, 
But even if you should suffer for righteousness' sake, you are blessed. Do not be afraid of their threats, nor be troubled. Verse 17 says, For it is better, if it is the will of God, to suffer for doing good than for doing evil. You see, as nice as you might be, you might be the nicest person in the world, but you're going to suffer. The world might see you as a generally good person, but, but zeal for that which is good is no guarantee against persecution. Something is wrong. If you never know any kind of suffering as a Christian, again, there's that promise in 2 Timothy 3, verse 12, all who desire to live godly in Christ Jesus will suffer persecution. You think about the example of your Lord, how he went about doing good and healing all who were oppressed by the devil, but the world still crucified him, knowing that Jesus was innocent. That's what makes it an honor to suffer with him. You see the innocence of, of your Lord. What a joy it is to suffer with him. And Jesus repeatedly warned that those who followed him faithfully, they wouldn't, ex they wouldn't escape the kinds of suffering that he experienced. He exemplified that for us. Perhaps Peter, when he penned these words, he was remembering his early days with Jesus. Because that word blessed that we read in 1 Peter chapter 3 is the same word we find there in the, in the Beatitudes in Matthew chapter 5, verse 10. Blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness' sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are you when they revile and persecute you and say all kinds of evil against you falsely for my name's sake. Rejoice and be exceedingly glad, for great is your reward in heaven. And so they persecuted the prophets who were before you. That word blessed refers to spiritual prosperity. Suffering for righteousness' sake will lend itself to salvation and spiritual growth. In this present life, you will be better for it. And for this reason, don't be afraid. Don't be afraid of physical persecution, of emotional persecution, of financial persecution in this temporal world. The very worst that this world has to offer is harm against your physical body. Matthew chapter 10, verse 28, Jesus already primed us against this. He says, do not fear those who, will cure the, who can kill the body but cannot kill the soul, but rather fear him who is able to destroy both the body and soul in hell. Peter's command to not fear persecution. It's an allusion to what we read in Isaiah chapter 8, verse 12, which says, do not say a conspiracy concerning all this the people call a conspiracy, nor be afraid of their threats, nor be troubled. The Lord of hosts, him you shall hallow. Let him be your fear and let him be your dread. What this is, is a call to courage don't let the world distress you to the degree that you are coerced into being silent. Don't let the world pressure you to the point where you will not defend the faith anymore. Suffering is never pleasant, but it's an inevitable part of life. Both the righteous and the just will suffer while on earth at some point on their life. You and I, though, just have a choice how we're going to suffer. Are we going to suffer for good or are we going to suffer for doing evil? God never desires the suffering of his children, but sometimes he allows it if it's for his good, if, if he will be glorified by it. Hebrews chapter 12, verse 11 says, Now no chastening seems to be joyful for the present, but painful. Nevertheless, afterwards it yields the peaceable fruit of righteousness to those who have been trained by it. Number three. Be devoted to Christ. Verse 15 says, but sanctify the Lord God in your hearts. I think about my Lord when he was giving us an example of how to pray. The first thing on his mind was he prayed to the Father, our Father who art in heaven. Hallowed be thy name. And that word hallowed is the very same word translated sanctify here in 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 15. 
The first priority in our heart should always be that Jesus is the Lord of our lives. We must affirm at all points his control over our lives, our allegiance to his commands, his guidance, his sovereignty. Jesus is Lord and we must bow to him. Our will, our passions, our decisions. The word sanctify, you know what it means. It means to to set apart, to devote. The context, however, means that Christ must have a very unique place in our hearts. Don't ever baptize someone, I would caution you, who you are not convinced has not sanctified the Lord Jesus in their hearts. Again, how much do you have to know to become a Christian? Well, what you need to know among the things that we've listed at the beginning of our lecture is that Jesus is Lord over your life that the Lord must be sanctified in your heart because what that guarantees is that when you inevitably learn more about his will for your life and the, the, the mysteries of the gospel are unlocked more and more and you understand how God wants you to live, there's no question what decision you will make. It doesn't matter how tough or difficult the doctrine is that God would have us accept. If Jesus is Lord over our life, you will comply because you love him. If you love me, you'll keep my commandments. John 14, 15. As we noted at the beginning of our lesson, unless Jesus is sanctified as Lord in our hearts, unless he's supreme, the one to be feared more than any human persecutor, unless he is Lord over our lives, and there is always going to be a very real danger of apostasy. And the only permanent safeguard against apostasy is to give Jesus the preeminence that he deserves in your heart, in your mind, in your life. And that's so critically important. Number four, be ready to defend the faith. Be ready. Verse 15 says, always be ready to give a defense to everyone who asks you a reason for the hope that is in you with meekness and fear. Rather than being intimidated or coerced into silence, and by the way, oh, how Satan loves it when Christians become reclusive because they're afraid. Instead of being intimidated, we need to be ready to give convincing reasons as to why we are Christians, why we believe what we believe, why we have hope, not just in this life, but fundamentally in the life to come. The word for ready Translated ready, not only carries the implication that we are to be ready or anxious and and willing to tackle whatever comes our way, but it also implies the necessity of taking adequate preparation for when those opportunities do come. I'm to be ready before those opportunities even come my way. That word defense comes from the Greek word apologia, which is where we get the word apologetics or apology. What that means is we need to be willing to defend the faith in any position or setting we find ourselves. Let us make sure that we are never unprepared, never unwilling, and never too sheepish to respond to those who attack us. Now, when you find yourself under fire, it's not the defensive self that you're interested in protecting. It's the one whose name you bear. Who cares about you? Who cares about me? It's all about glorifying our Lord. It's the name of Christ we aim to protect. For that reason, it's so important that we exhibit the right qualities when under fire. I'm going to give you six qualities that you and I need to exhibit. This is not in the manuscript. This is a bonus. I'm not even going to charge you for it. Number one, you need to have a peaceable disposition. Uh, I want you to look at 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 24. Where Paul says, a servant of the Lord must not quarrel, but be gentle to all. I think about Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. They were not quarrelsome. As they were standing before that idol, as the whole nation was bowing down, they didn't. The king was so flabbergasted. Why aren't you bowing down? They were not hostile. They weren't caustic. They weren't bitter. They weren't ugly. They just said, we don't need to answer you in this matter. Don't you love that spirit? Think about Peter and the apostles when they were caught once again preaching the gospel in the temple. What did they say? They weren't ugly. They weren't caustic. They they weren't disrespectful. They, They simply said, we ought to obey God rather than men. You and I need to have that spirit when we are under fire because we're protecting the name we wear. 
We need to have a ready ability. That's number two. Again, 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 24 says, we need to be able to teach. Able to teach. The only weapon that God has given you and I, spiritually speaking, is the gospel. When I think about the whole armor of God in Ephesians chapter 6, it's interesting that of all those pieces that are mentioned, the helmet, the, the breastplate, the belt, the, the only item that is both defensive and offensive is the sword of the Spirit. You ever notice that? What that means is you and I need to be ready to teach. 2 Timothy chapter 4, verse 2 says, preach the word. Don't you love this? It's the, the, the great Magna Carta of preaching. Preach the word, be ready in season and out of season, convince, rebuke, exhort with all long suffering and teaching. We have to be willing. We have to be able. Which brings us to number three. We need to have a bold approach. Titus chapter 2, verse 15 says, we need to speak these things. Exhort and rebuke with all authority. Let no one despise you. When under fire, Christians need a double dose of boldness. We can't be afraid to speak the truth. We live in an age when doubt is alive and well in our churches and specifically in our pulpits. More and more preachers are more interested in deconstructing the faith than building it up. What we need more than anything else are preachers who will preach boldly and plainly. What does the word teach? Number four, we need to have a kind attitude. Going back to 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 25 says, in humility, correcting those who are in opposition. And this is what Peter's commanding us in our text in 1 Peter chapter 3. We are to defend the faith in meekness. What that means is do not misrepresent an opponent's position. Do not slander an opponent's character. Do not be hostile. Do not be ill-mannered. Treat those who are opposing you in a way that you would want to be treated Matthew chapter 7, verse 12. Number five, we've got to have a patient spirit. 2 Timothy 2, verse 24 says we are to be patient. The word for patient has very special reference in the context, in the, in the, in, in, in the Greek, to patience when specifically wronged. The ESV translates that verse a little bit better where it says patiently enduring evil. And while we are to be kind under fire, we're not going to receive always the same treatment from those who are attacking the faith. Proverbs 9 verse 7 says, he who corrects a scoffer gets shame for himself, and he who rebukes a wicked man only harms himself. If you care enough to protect the name of Christ when your faith is under fire, you will be hit with false accusations, with hatred, with dishonorable attacks, intolerance. Be ready for it and be patient. And number six, you need to have a consistent walk. Peter talks about this, of course. We're going to get to that in just a moment where he says, have a good conscience. First Timothy chapter four, verse 16 says, take heed to yourself and to all the doctrine, continue in them. For in doing this, you will save both yourself and those who hear you. A lack of integrity in your walk with the Lord is going to do nothing but short-circuit your efforts to defend the faith. Titus told Timothy, or Titus was told by Paul to maintain a good character, to have sound speech, as Titus chapter 2 verse 7 says, so that the opponent will be put to shame, having nothing bad to say about us. How do you live? Does it give people a reason to not believe a word you say? How strange the world must think it when we defend the reason for the hope within us. When they see us do it as Christ would have us do it. Philippians chapter 4 verse 7 says, says the peace of God which surpasses all understanding will guard your hearts and your mind through Christ Jesus. The meaning of, a text, of the text is that we need to be able to explain in all the qualities that we just listed we must be able to explain the hope that we have in heaven. Do you think there's life after death? 
do you believe in a heaven and hell? What's the big deal about this Jesus? What does it mean to be saved? How can you be sure you are saved? Well, why should I follow Christianity instead of some of these Eastern religions? Are you able to answer any of those questions? Are you able? We must be able to answer these in a very clear, intelligent way. Lastly, we must protect the conscience. Verse 16 says, having a good conscience so that when they defame you as evildoers, those who revile your good conduct in Christ may be ashamed. Now, the conscience is the part of the mind which drives you to do that which is right. And it, it accuses you when you know you do something that is wrong. But the conscience, of course, is not always right. The moral compass written on the human heart is from God and it can be perverted over time. It can be seared. We find that the heart can be perverted because of, because of our sin. Ephesians chapter 2, 1 through 3 talks about how we were dead in our trespasses, dead in our sins. We were sons of disobedience because of our sins. We were by nature children of wrath because of our sins. What is that? You sin. And it perverts the conscience. And so we are not led exclusively by the conscience. Ezekiel chapter 13 verse 1 says, The word of the Lord came to me saying, Son of man, prophesy against the prophets of Israel who prophesy and say to those who prophesy out of their own heart. Thus says the Lord God, Woe to the foolish prophets who follow their own spirit. Don't just follow your conscience. Peter says, having a good conscience, and thus we must keep the conscience. We need to guard the conscience with all purity. Paul told Timothy in 1 Timothy chapter 1, verse 5, the aim of our charge is love that issues from a pure heart and a good conscience and a sincere faith. A good conscience is the reason you have hope in heaven. And it's when we are under fire from the world, how nice it is to have a conscience refined by the word of God that does not condemn us as having done anything wrong. It's a great peace knowing that when I am under fire, when I am under attack, when I am, being, when I am suffering for Christ, that it's because I was simply trying to serve my, my, my Lord the best I could out of my heart. I don't have to continually second guess myself because I was seeking him. And so before we make a defense and after we make a defense, we must follow, follow the Lord with a good conscience. Because the world does not understand so many of the doctrines and practices of Christianity, isn't it interesting how unbelievers are very quick to jump to false conclusions about us? He who is without sin, cast the first stone. You ever heard that before? Jesus said, don't judge. You think you're the only ones going to heaven? Oh, you're the ones that don't believe in music. Statements like these, of course, just betray a shallow understanding of the one making these statements. But Peter's saying that we need to live in such a way where such a blameless, consistent way that when we are slandered, and attacked with such statements that how we live puts those people to shame. You can't help but think about Stephen's opponents when they, when they saw his wisdom. They couldn't withstand it. There in Acts chapter 6, verse 10, our actions, our words, our lifestyle needs to have a very similar effect on those who attempt to defame the name of Christ. It's interesting that our Lord is called the Prince peace. Isaiah 9 verse 6. But the great paradox of following this prince of peace is that you are going to be hated by all for his name's sake. Matthew 10 22. Jesus came so that you can know the peace of God which surpasses all understanding in this life. But in the process he passed his will to us after living a life of near constant derision of men. 
all who would follow Jesus, we must focus our eyes on the cross, being prepared to make a defense to everyone who asks for a reason for the hope in us. And that's the responsibility of all of us who are saved. I look at the world, I see the news and how depressing the, our culture is that we live in, and sometimes it seems like evil is winning. But it's not. And what a joy it is to defend the faith, knowing that the battle has already been won. Keep preaching the truth. Keep defending the faith. Thank you for your attention.